Russian forces appear closer to taking control of Severodonetsk, a key city in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region. The regional governor says the last bridge in and out has been destroyed, making it impossible to organize humanitarian aid or evacuations to neighboring Lushchansk. But Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says his forces could still reclaim territory in the region if they are supplied with the weapons they need. Firing back, Ukrainian defense forces say this aerial footage shows the destruction of three Russian Grad rocket launchers, which they believe were used to shell the embattled city of Severodonetsk and surrounding areas. Street battles are raging in the eastern city. The governor of the region says it is mostly under Russian control. Much of Severodonetsk has been destroyed. Authorities believe some 500 civilians, including children, are sheltering at the vast Azot chemical plant. Ukraine has accused Russia of shelling the works and sparking a fire. Russian-backed separatists say they're holding back from the plant to avoid an environmental catastrophe. Images that remind Ukrainians of the siege in Mariupol's steelworks just weeks ago. But the Ukrainian president remains defiant. We're dealing with absolute evil, and we have no other choice but to move forward. Free our entire territory, kick the occupiers out of all our regions. And although the width of our front is already more than two and a half thousand kilometers, you can feel that our strategy is still working. The Russian Ministry of Defense released footage claiming to show their troops opening fire on Ukrainian militants. Their spokesperson said they had hit important targets. In the Donetsk People's Republic, high-precision air-launched missiles destroyed a large number of weapons and military equipment delivered to the Ukrainian nationalists including weapons from the U.S. and European countries. Back in Tsverodonetsk, the constant shelling and exchange of fire rages on, with no end in sight and all bridges out of the city cut. Let's bring in our correspondent, Emmanuel Shahs. She joins us from Kiev. Emmanuel, tell us more about the situation in Severodonetsk. What do we know about the civilians who remain there with little prospect of being evacuated? Uh, well, uh, Terry, first off, we had to take shelter here because there's been an airstrike alert, which is why I'm here in the uh, Kiev uh, metro, where other people are also taking uh, shelter. So that's for the setting. The situation in Severodonetsk, there's a lot of civilians who are still trapped there. It is believed that up to 500 civilians are there, including dozens of children, and they can no longer be evacuated because the three bridges leading uh, to that city have now been destroyed by Russian forces. Uh, with the bridges being destroyed, it means that no humanitarian aid, nor aid, nor uh, evacuations can uh, take place uh, right now. So no humanitarian aid uh, supplies can go into the city and no civilians can be evacuated. They live under extremely strenuous conditions and of course there's concerns uh, for uh, uh, their uh, lives at a time where there's constant shelling happening over the region. Well, while that is happening, uh, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has been speaking with the German broadcaster uh, ZDF. Uh, in an interview, he appealed for more support from Berlin. Let's hear what he had to say. We need assurances from Chancellor Scholz that Germany supports Ukraine. He and his government have to make a decision. They should not try to find a balance between Ukraine and their relationship with Russia. I mean, Ukraine's government has often said it's not getting enough support from Germany in this war. Uh, is that how the people you're talking to there see it as well? Definitely. I think people don't understand why there have been so many promises of heavy weapons being delivered and they simply don't see the result now. Of course, governments on both sides, be it the Ukrainian side or uh, in uh, so the allies, they're not going to reveal what's being delivered when and where uh, it is being put on the front line. However, uh, you know, 
Vladimir Zelensky say that in his latest address that all that Ukrainian forces needed was those weapons uh, to be able to liberate more cities which have been occupied by the Russian uh, aggress aggressor. So there's uh, very little patience left here uh, in the population because, you know, at the end of the day, Ukrainians are paying uh, with their blood this, uh, this war on the front line. Every day people are dying and they simply don't understand why weapons aren't making their way quicker to the front line. Now, Russia has been accused of war crimes in, in uh, this conflict. Amnesty International is accusing Russia of using banned cluster bombs in Ukraine's second largest city, Kharkiv. What more can you tell us about that? Well, uh, indeed, this is an independent, uh, independent report from Amnesty International. There's evidence that uh, Russia uh, has uh, used cluster bombs. So that means those bombs that, uh, you know, are made of several different smaller bombs, which indiscriminately uh, fall uh, on a quite a wide area, thus uh, affecting and falling on civilians sometimes. There's been this evidence of war crime for Kharkiv uh, only, but other investigations are underway for other parts. A team of forensic uh, uh, officials found uh, another mass grave in the uh, now uh, sadly infamous city of Bucha. People who, uh, whose hands had been tied up, shot in the head. So every day there's more war crimes being unfolded all over the country. Emmanuel, thank you very much. That was our correspondent, Emmanuel Shaz, there in Kiev. Well, let's get to the military perspective on all this. Uh, Justin Crump is a military analyst and runs an intelligence consultancy in the UK. Thanks for being with us, Justin. The battle for the Donbass mm. seems to be reaching a critical point, particularly in Severodonetsk. How do you see things unfolding there? Severodonetsk is the focus at the moment, as you rightly say, although I think that will rapidly move westwards with increasing Russian efforts on the cities uh, in Donetsk. But Severodonetsk, the focus because of the, uh, it's the last bit of Luhansk Oblast, it's the most exposed bit of the Ukrainian line. Uh, and so it's politically important for both sides and it's militarily particularly important for Russia because they're trying to cause as many casualties as possible to the Ukrainians at this time to try and encircle and capture Ukrainian forces, to defeat the Ukrainian forces in the Donbass. So, I think the Russian point of view is this is the first domino to fall and that by reducing Severodonetsk they can start to increase the tempo of what they've been doing. Again, we're over 110 days in um, at this point and they're still fighting over some of the same area they were, they've been fighting over since 2014-15. So I think Russia keen to be making more progress over the summer now and, and hopefully this will be the first part. The city itself is hard to defend. It's on the wrong side of the river for Ukraine. Uh, the, there are three bridges crossing the river that are believed to have been destroyed now, so Ukrainian forces are faced with a challenge to withdraw um, to the bank where their friendly forces are, and the city of Lysychansk, which is on the high ground overlooking Severodonetsk. That'll be the harder fight, in fact, in Severodonetsk itself, but Russia working very hard to try and um, attack that city from the south, if it can, in the coming days to try and force the Ukrainians back more quickly. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, he is determined to push Russian forces back across the border. He says his country desperately needs more help, though, from abroad. What can Ukraine's backers in the EU and North America do? Uh, what more can they do that they're not already doing? Um, I mean, the requests that are coming out, I think, for, for parity in weapons with Russia um, put Ukraine asking for around 1,000 field artillery pieces, 300 multiple launch rocket systems, and 500 main battle tanks, um, which probably is about the same level as what Russia has deployed into Ukraine itself. Um, so, you know, on the face of it, that's a fair request. But to put it in perspective, uh, the British Army, for example, has a total of 220 main battle tanks, of which most are not in service at the moment. Um, 1,000 field guns is more than all 10 active duty US um, divisions in the US Army. Uh, so that's a huge number of pieces of equipment. So it's very unlikely to get that, frankly, uh, just because the stockpiles are not there to send that. Um, now, in theory, when you're defending in war, 
you work on the basis the attacker has three times as much as the defender, um, and that should be a balanced fight. Uh, Ukraine's seen the advantage of that in this conflict, being the defender most of the time. Um, and so that applies actually if they had about a third as much and they could probably defend effectively. But defending alone does not win wars. And we've just seen this, this course in the Donbass that Russia is slowly grinding forwards. Um, they're putting pressure on everywhere to take every inch of ground. So uh, that's the sort of um, ask that the Ukrainians have if they're going to actually balance the fight rather than just gradually, slowly being ground down. Uh, now, obviously, the hope is that Russia also gets ground down and fighting reaches an impasse. We're not there yet, uh, nor will I think will be for a few weeks, but um, that's the sort of hope, I think, in this, this style of fighting. Now, Ukraine totally dependent, really, at this point, on Western artillery ammunition, though. That's the key thing they need to keep having. Without that, their firepower is going to diminish. Justin, thank you very much for your analysis. That was Justin Crump with the Sibylline Intelligence Consultancy in London. The United Nations says more than 7 million people have left Ukraine since the war began. Around 100,000 have traveled to Bulgaria. Many have been staying there in hotels on the Black Sea coast. Now they're having to make way for summer visitors. DW's Fanny Fachar reports. Okay, Yuri. Yeah. Time to get moving again. Everyone here fled from Ukraine months ago. Now they are being relocated from Bulgaria's coast to state facilities across the country. How long they will stay is unclear. It is very hard with two children. There is nowhere I can just leave them. They're on the move with me. Up until June, about 60,000 refugees were staying in these hotels along the Bulgarian Black Sea. But just before the summer season, Bulgaria reduced the compensation to hotel operators from 20 euros per refugee per day to eight. The director of this hotel complex says that's not nearly enough to cover the costs. It's clear this is our business, tourism, so there was no way they could stay on during the summer season. Due to a lack of seasonal workers, he decided to keep some Ukrainian refugees on. Karina and Marina Potopenko are among those who can stay. Before the war, they managed a flower business in Kharkiv. Now they are getting trained how to set a lunch table. It's difficult to plan at all. We don't know what will happen tomorrow, but we plan to stay here for the summer season and work. They fled with their children. Their husbands in Ukraine could be drafted at any time, they say. It's hard for us to process everything because we are full of sorrow for our country. Bulgaria is in dire need of tourists. Russian tourists were one of the biggest groups of foreign visitors, but they are staying away due to sanctions. It's unclear how many will come, but some here are happy that the refugees are now being accommodated elsewhere. I think we helped enough. It is not necessary to help them anymore. The issue of Ukrainian refugees is increasingly polarizing Bulgarian society. There's still a lot of solidarity. In the capital, Sofia, this demonstration is a call for help. These people here say the war against Ukraine is unjustified, yet polls show about one-third of Bulgarians still maintain a positive attitude towards Putin. And sociologist Dimitar Ganev says that the longer Russia's war against Ukraine continues, the harder it will be to maintain solidarity with Ukraine. The louder the pro-Russian voices get, the worse the Ukrainian refugees will feel here in Bulgaria. Marina and Karina know little about the ongoing debate about their status. They try to provide moments of joy to their children. On the other side of the sea, Ukraine, where the war rages on. Now, he was once a popular singer playing to millions in packed venues and on Russian state television. In Tarsh Busulis, with his Russian lyrics, the Latvian artist won a legion of fans and a paycheck to match. But with the invasion of Ukraine, he began to rethink his part in Russia's propaganda machine. Now he's an outspoken critic of the Kremlin, and that has turned many of his fans against him. 
Intosh Busulis was a star in Russia. The Latvian singer performed on Russian state media and even held concerts in the Kremlin. He toured the world's largest country singing in Russian, celebrating the language and enjoyed the company of his Russian fans. I still can't fully believe it's all over, that I might not return there in the next 50 years and I won't have concerts there. The 24th of February changed everything, he told us, as we visited him in his home studio. The place where Busuli's creative process begins. For weeks he's been working on a song about the war. Finally, Busulis is speaking out. He's been sharing videos and photos of the war on social media. His aim? To confront his Russian fans with the reality of violence in Ukraine. Death and destruction. Images that aren't shown on Russian state media. Although his fans in Russia have seen his posts, many are still not convinced. It's a paradox. The biggest fans who wrote the most loving comments have turned into my biggest enemies. They have gone crazy and they are attacking me. It's a potentially dangerous situation for Busulis. Putin's propaganda has also played a role in his home country. Every fourth person living in Latvia is of Russian descent. Recently, he was verbally assaulted by a passerby in his hometown. People have cursed at me, but I tell them everything is fine. I understand you. Don't worry, you're not guilty for thinking that. Your brain has been corrupted by the propaganda. Intosh Busulis wants to change the perspective of his fans. Someday he hopes to return to Russia and perform again. Maybe even bring his kids as well. But only if it's a new Russia, one without Putin. Well, for more on that, we're joined here in our studio by our correspondent, Emily Sherwin. She used to be our correspondent in Moscow, but is now back with us in Berlin. Emily, how common is it that artists uh, previously loved by Russians are now cancelled because of their anti-war stance? Well, quite a lot of well-known Russian celebrities or celebrities who were well-known within Russia um, have come out against the war and some of them, you know, were really firmly part of the establishment, I would say. And there's been a mixed reaction. Some of them have gotten a lot of support from their fans, depending on those their political views, and some of them have gotten quite a bit of backlash. One example is, for, for example, um, Manija, who you might re remember was Russia's Eurovision um, uh, candidate. She um, got her concerts cancelled within Russia recently for her criticism of the war. There's comedian and presenter Maxim Galkin, who also, you know, he's married to Russia's version of Madonna, essentially, Ala Pugachova, very much an establishment figure. He's been talking on Instagram a lot about the war, and he says that TV has been launching a kind of smear campaign campaign against him, almost painting him as a criminal. Within Russia, there are also um, artists who've been coming out against the war, despite the fact that they're still in the country. So, for example, um, one uh, Russian rock group um, singer, Yev Yuri Ch Shevchuk, said recently that we shouldn't be kissing up to the president all the time and that the president is not Russia. And he was cheered on stage by his fans, but then he got in trouble with the police. So the authorities are making it very clear what people's stance should be, but there's, of course, a mix of reactions from the fans, depending on what their political views are. 
How do you explain the backlash against these artists? I mean, they're really just you know, offering an opinion or saying what they think is happening in Ukraine. I think it's really interesting that these celebrities are using, in, in many cases, social media to reach out to their followers. Often they have tens of thousands of followers. And I think what they're trying to do is break through this propaganda bubble that state TV particularly is creating. And that bubble really is strong, particularly since the war. You know, after the war started, which is, of course, called a special operation within Russia, Russian state TV actually canceled all entertainment programs and they went full force on the political route. So, you know, this is really a strong machine. And um, I think these celebrities are working hard to break through that. But we hear again and again stories of even people in Ukraine saying that their relatives within Russia don't believe them when they tell them what's actually happening. And instead, they believe Russian state propaganda. So is there any way for artists in Russia to still be candid about the war in Ukraine? I think it's really hard, and a lot of people who have an anti-war stance, including celebrities, have left Russia, um, including because, you know, there's this new law about spreading um, so-called fake news about the war, which can lead to up to 15 years in prison. But being political was always hard, I think, for artists, you know, even in the, in the past few years as well. There were cases of um, musicians who came out in favor of the opposition in Russia, in favor of opposition leader Alexei Navalny, having their concerts canceled canceled, having FSB, um, you know, state security um, forces kind of intimidating them or arresting them, you know, at their concerts, all kinds of uh, stories like that. And censorship, you know, for the last decades and even centuries, you would say, in Russia has been common for artists and it's a fine line that they've always had to walk. So it's hard for artists to come out and uh, with, with these kind of statements supporting Ukraine, for example, but what about just informing yourself as a citizen in Russia? Uh, can you find independent information on the internet and get access to it? Well, it's getting harder and harder, including because uh, many of the last remaining critical media outlets within Russia were kind of closed in the first few weeks of the war and also many critical media outlets from outside the country are being blocked, including the BBC, DW, many other media outlets. So the only way of really accessing information that's critical is by getting a VPN. So essentially people have to mask their IP addresses and say that they're in a different country, but that's hard. So that's, I think, also why it's important that these celebrities are using their platforms to reach out to users who aren't necessarily looking for that information about the war, but they get it anyway. Emily, thank you very much. Uh, that was our correspondent, Emily Sherwin.